making space sustainable. With Daniel Bob from Morpheus Space. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we're going to look at making space sustainable, talking with Daniel Bach from Morpheus Space. We could be looking at how we can move into the inner solar system and beyond, while protecting the environments of Earth, Moon, and Mars, as well as ensuring the future of space travel. Now, the first and most obvious way to improve the sustainability of spaceflight is through the use of reusable boosters, as well as the development of greener fuel alternatives. Biofuels, for example, emit fewer harmful particles into the atmosphere than traditional fuels and are an important step toward reducing carbon emissions during launch. Now, lifting off from Earth takes nearly all the fuel in a rocket, and most systems today shed empty fuel tanks and boosters once they pass beyond our planetary atmosphere. Now, this process can also shed smaller debris, potentially posing hazards in the future. There are currently 27,000 known pieces of space-borne flotsam larger than a softball being tracked in orbit around Earth, and there could be a hundred million such pieces larger than a millimeter in diameter whizzing around our planet. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, sure is. Now, being hit by a screw is one thing. Being hit by a screw flying at 10 kilometers a second is an entirely different issue. Now, minimizing waste released into space is a priority, keeping low Earth orbit as clear as possible for spaceflight. Now, Apple co-founder and pioneer of the personal computer revolution, Steve Wozniak, recently founded Privateer Space, focused on clearing potentially hazardous debris from low Earth orbit. Was yeah, yeah, he's cool. Uh, the Orbex Prime rocket is designed to be one of the most environmentally friendly launch systems ever designed. This two-stage rocket is 19 meters tall. You know what? I'm gonna save you the math. That's 8.6 Peter Mayhew standing on top of each other. You're welcome. Powered by a 3D printed propane fueled engine, this green booster is reusable, producing 96% fewer emissions than comparable boosters, and the system leaves no debris in orbit. Propane. Yep. Yeah. The ultimate in clean fuels may be solar sails. Now, these are exactly what they sound like spacecraft powered through the pressure of light coming from the sun, gently pushing on a large reflective sail. Now, once in space, these sails create a gentle yet continuous acceleration, capable of taking a spacecraft from one planet to another. And the best part? No fuel required. Solar sails could offer us a clean, sustainable, cost-effective way of exploring the inner solar system. They could also be attached to wayward space junk, moving debris out of the way of active satellites. Now, as our species grows, heading out into the cosmos, we can explore and populate the Moon and Mars. This exploration will drive science, social progress, and technology. The means to do that in the coming years and decades are being developed right now by both nations and startups around the globe. Next up, we're going to talk with one of these innovators, Daniel Bach, CEO and co-founder of Morpheus Space. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. 
and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Daniel Bach. He is CEO and co-founder of Morpheus Space, and now working to make space safe, accessible, and exciting to everyone. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Thank you, James. Uh, happy to be here. Excellent. So can you give us a little bit of a look at Morpheus? What is it that you folks are, are doing, and what is it that you hope to accomplish? Um, I think you already put it in a nutshell. So we want to make space more accessible, safer, and more exciting. Um, how we are doing that is by um, offering um, a range of different products uh, that we have included in one ecosystem that we call the Sphere. And uh, these products all have one aim, um, to make uh, in-space maneuvering uh, much easier and autonomous and in, in bottom line also scalable so that we can increase the accessibility. So meaning uh, that much more people and companies can uh, use space as an infrastructure and a commodity. Uh, we are also tackling the issue of um, potential collisions in space with our uh, mm. um, yeah, collision avoidance uh, maneuvers. And we also want to make space more exciting. Um, so getting back to the inspirational aspect of space. So we've been, uh, we had a great uh, period in the 60s and 70s. And uh, now it's, I think, the next era to uh, inspire people with space again. Mm. And it is such an exciting, you know, exciting frontier for people, then, you know, I think it can really, the exploration of space, I think is our greatest hope of uniting humanity. Absolutely. I strongly um, share that, that vision as well. And uh, I think we can, yeah, bring humanity back uh, together or finally get to back if we have a common, common mission and common sense. And I think space can, can be one, one of these uh, regions. Um, so maybe I can also jump in a little bit more concrete what we are doing. So mm -hmm. to provide this um, autonomous uh, in-space mobility that ranges from products uh, really hard on the hardware nature. So we are producing electric propulsion systems for satellites. Mm -hmm. um, the smallest and most modular ones uh, there are. So this is, wow. for example, the mm. thruster. Yeah, and yeah. it's a modular concept. So uh, no matter how big your satellite is, even the smallest ones can be equipped with that. And if you have a bigger satellite, you just use multiple of these stacked together. Um, so that's like the enabling technology on the hardware level. And But that's not all. We also need to uh, make the operations in space much easier. So we are offering um, a variety of different uh, software products for autonomous um, maneuvering. So, for example, an autopilot, you can imagine... It like um, an autopilot in a self-driving car, but for satellites. So that mm -hmm. brings uh, uh, one satellite from one orbit to the other in, in an autonomous way. Um, and it also includes um, software uh, that operates whole constellations or so networks of, of satellites or so multiple satellites uh, with one um, joint mission to rearrange the whole network to, for the first time, enable dynamic constellations so that means that uh, the infrastructure can adapt on the needs um, that we have on Earth. So if it's Earth observation or communication, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, we make um, yeah, the infrastructure and space more flexible and adjustable to our needs on Earth. Fabulous. And so can you give us a little bit more of a look at how propulsion systems and satellite mobility uh, assist us in creating a more sustainable you know, environmentally friendly, satellite friendly environment in low Earth orbit. Um, yeah, so if we are, are having a look in, in low Earth orbit, so there are 
countless uh, numbers of uh, space debris. So that mm. is, for example, old, uh, not access anymore satellites, but it's also fragments of satellites or uh, the prominent, you know, um, a screwdriver that was lost from the ISS. So it, it's, a, it's a bunch of different things, uh, hundreds of thousands and even millions um, of uh, fragments floating around Earth. And we have also the active satellites. And um, the number of active satellites is also uh, on an exponential growth um, um, phase. So the, all these satellites need to avoid each other, to, to collide with each other, but also with the space debris. And um, one important aspect is to provide the means to make that uh, a reality. So at the moment, uh, everything is extremely manually. So you get maybe an alert from um, the US Space Force that there might be a collision uh, up in the next few days. Um, and then it's up to you to uh, try to uh, contact the other satellite provider or uh, decide if you if you need to do an, um, a maneuver to avoid a collision. And we want to make that much easier and um, yeah, in a scalable manner so that you don't have to um, figure out on your own anymore what to do with your uh, satellite. So that will also, uh, of course, uh, limit the creation of new space debris because if a collision happens, uh, then thousands of, of different pieces are, are created again, and that can um, basically create an avalanche, and we might end up in a, in a few years or decades that we cannot use space anymore if we have too much debris up there. So it's really um, a big uh, issue to tackle, and um, yeah, we are, we are happy that we can contribute to this. Yeah, and the challenge of space debris is quite real, and as you say, it's getting yeah. getting worse by the moment. And you now, of course, Steve Wozniak, he mm -hmm. knew his name was going to come up here somewhere. <laughs> you know, has talked. To, he's talking about you know having a space debris removal service. You know, Woz's was his trash, trash collection. Um, <laughs> but what other ways, I mean, I realize how your systems are helping us reduce the amount of future space debris, but are there other ways that we have of getting rid of some of this debris? Um, yeah, that's that's also, of course, possible. Um, so besides avoiding collisions, you can also, um, yeah, get rid of your old satellite before it's too late. So you can deorbit your satellite with a propulsion system, for example. So that mm -hmm. means that it will burn up in an Earth atmosphere uh, without uh, being a, a, any danger anymore for other satellites. But you can also actively remove uh, old uh, debris parts or old satellites. Um, for this, you need to fly there, uh, grab it, and then uh, bring it uh, down to Earth or to the uh, atmosphere again. Um, so we are not doing that on our own, um, but our technology can be used by other companies that are specializing in that topic of grabbing old uh, satellites. That's also a big, uh, big part uh, of the industry that's coming up, um, especially the most dangerous um, pieces that are up there to get rid of them um, yeah, first um, to decrease the risk of, of future con uh, con collisions. Hmm. And and yeah, uh, Wozniak's uh, startup or, or a new company is tackling that problem, uh, for example, by getting better data and a better uh, understanding of where debris is and how we can uh, get that and uh, how we can avoid also um, any any um, collisions with that debris. So um, I'm a I'm a strong supporter of, of their vision as well, and I'm I'm yeah. I'm very happy that uh, we are also working together. Hmm. And um, you talked about the system, about your systems being scalable. So are you able or will you be able to bring the same technology that you're using around Earth orbit out to, say, a lunar orbit or even out to Mars someday? Are these same ideals and same systems or variations of these same systems going to be working there as well yes exactly so that's our plan of course a uh, more long-term plan um but it doesn't stop at uh our earth orbits so of course uh, lunar orbits and uh, and also mars at some point um will be critical so we have to build up infrastructure there as well in the, in the next years and decades 
Um, when I'm talking about scalability, um, that doesn't stop um, at, for example, the modular approach of our propulsion system. So it is, of course, connected to hardware and scaling up production, but it is it also includes uh, making um, the whole operation scalable. So getting away from manual operations, automatize things so that whole businesses and, and the whole industry get, get uh, more scalable. And yeah, we are uh, trying to tackling that problem with, with our platform in many regards. So how can you basically scale your business in an easy way um, by um, providing easy solutions to address uh, new customers, to sell your products, um, to um, yeah, do the whole uh, invoicing and everything. <laughs> also on the operational uh, aspect of the business. Hmm. And so can you tell us about some of the technical challenges that Morbius has had to overcome and how you've overcome them? So uh, that's a great question. So um, every space technology is uh, not easy to develop. So we started um, over a decade ago, actually. So it was uh, beginning of the uh, 2010s. Uh, um, and uh, so we are a uh, spin out of a German university. I started my research uh, in 2011. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my task so back then, there was no, not really a commercial space industry yet. Um, so it was more driven out of curiosity and the academia drive. Uh, we wanted to um, develop the smallest possible and most efficient uh, partial system there is. And then when um, the commercial aspect of space picked up over the years, um, we more and more concentrated also on the scalability of the product and the production uh, capability. And of course, there are multiple challenges uh, during the development. So first of all, you need to uh, concentrate on that it works. So um, uh, create demonstrators. Uh, the next challenge was, of course, to miniaturize it. So um, having the same performance in a much smaller um, um, size and, and uh, um, weight um, ratio. And so, for example, our technology needs high voltage, so uh, really high um, um, fields, electrical fields. And that is a challenge if you want to do that on a small scale. So we really had to innovate on many technical uh, fronts there. And uh, the other challenge, of course, uh, is also when you have a demonstrator and the first prototype to get that in a stage where it's a, a real product that you can scale for production. And that um, is, yeah, basically always uh, performing as you intend with, with the first uh, prototype. Hmm. And do you see these systems as being the beginning of a of a sustainable exploration of the inner solar system? I mean, we could be dumping, you know, you know, if you want to explore the system, you can do it a good way, you can do it a bad way, and probably a bunch of ways in between, you know. But do you see um, this as being more of as driving exploration space exploration in a more sustainable environmentally friendly uh, direction yes I, I think so uh so absolutely on a sustainable and more environmental friendly uh, aspect when we are talking about interplanetary um, missions or exploration of course that's that's quite a challenge still um, so you need to combine different technologies to achieve that. Um, so, for example, we are working together with NASA and the Aerospace Corporation on a uh, very ambitious and I think the most ambitious uh, scientific mission uh, there was until uh, today, um, which is called the um, um, Solar Gravity Lens Mission. Mm -hmm. And the goal here is to fly outside of our solar system, so 550 uh, astronomical units. So that's 550 times the, the distance between Earth and uh, and the Sun. Mm -hmm. And to put that into perspective, so the f uh, farthest uh, um, probes so far are Voyager 1 and 2. And I think they are out about 150 uh, astronomical units. 
And they started in the 1970s and it took them 50 years to get there. And by combining uh, different technologies, uh, state of the art uh, from NASA Aerospace and also our technology, um, it will be possible to get much further out uh, of our solar system uh, in a much shorter time. So the planned mission time is 30 years still, um, but that makes it uh, possible to being still alive uh, and seeing the results of, of that mission. That's beautiful. And there's so much good science to be done out there as well. Of course, you know, the interstellar probe is planning on going out to 100 plus AUs just to just to see what's out there. Yeah, and I, I think we, we need to uh, continue doing that and accelerate that. So I think that's in the nature of our humankind. We want to explore new worlds. We want, I think that's so deep in our uh, in our species uh, DNA um to endeavor the world and beyond and um i think that's that's what makes life uh, um, uh livable and uh, why we are living actually excellent and finally what is next for morpheus what is what's next for daniel what what problems are exciting you now um so in the startup of course there are a lot of challenges all the way uh, so on a really short term uh, scale, we are um, ramping up our production. So at the moment we are um, uh, moving into a bigger facility. Uh, we will increase our production rate by, by uh, 10x and uh, we need to cover the demand that we see. And uh, on the other, other side, we are um, bringing our, our different uh, software products, uh, which is still outstanding, some of them uh, on the market uh, still this year. So a lot of mm -hmm. product development as well. And yeah, scaling the, the company and the team. Um, so we are on two continents uh, in the US, our headquarters in, in, in Los Angeles and in Germany, our production and hardware development. And yeah, we, we want to uh, work on our mission and um, stepwise bring it, bring it to life. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Daniel. It was great talking with you. And so it was an honor and I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was uh, Daniel Bach, CEO and co-founder of Morpheus Space. As space tourism grows, cost to travel beyond the Earth will plummet. Within a decade or so, the price of a trip to space should equal that of a luxury cruise on the oceans of Earth. Still out of the reach of most people, but low enough to make space tourism far more common than it is today. As this industry grows, it's essential to consider the impact it will have on the environment of Earth as well as destinations beyond our home world. Hi, it's me, Gaia. Mother Nature. Whatever you'd like to call me. Anyway, Maynard is right. It doesn't matter where you go. I'll always be watching you. I mean, caring for you. Now, please take care of these lovely worlds. Thanks. The Age of Sail lasted for three centuries, from about 1550, about the time Copernicus first put forth his wacky idea that the Earth revolves around the Sun, until about 1850, just before the invention of the refrigerator. Similar sailing ships could once again soar to distant worlds, this time racing through the vast expanse of space powered by the constant push of light from our life-giving star. This technology could also be adapted to passenger ships riding the breeze of light from the sun, Guests will marvel at the beauty of space soaring aboard the environmentally friendly sailing ships of the 21st century and beyond. The future of space travel is not just about reaching for the stars, but also about preserving the beauty and wonder of worlds for future generations to enjoy. By adopting more sustainable practices, we can continue to explore the cosmos while reducing our impact on the environment. So, let's raise our solar sails and set sights on a greener future for space exploration.
Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we're going to look at diversity in space exploration from the dawn of the space age to our future among the stars. We'll be talking with Meredith Bagby, author of The New Guys, the story of NASA's legendary class of 1978. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please subscribe, follow, share, do all that social media stuff, and tell your friends about the show. Head on over to thecosmiccompanion.com and sign up to get every episode in your email inbox. Free and VIP subscriptions are available, and educators get 25% off VIP subscriptions with any .edu email address. Clear skies.